This is a reading of all present community lore in the Finding Game Trello. Enjoy. The world is a chaotic one, and it breeds chaotic things. The passing mage in modern day could cast a stray glance outside of a window, and a life-saving bet could be comfortably placed on the possibility of finding yet another stubborn fight or a blooming crime. Those that focus on alignment often do so for little more than a reward, acting in the most putative ways behind closed doors, silencing those that even have a chance of exposing their actions. In this same hurricane of mystery and magic that is called life, there are people that chase the good, the fun, the competition, the adventure, the adrenaline. They would waltz into a crowded enterprise with no intention of walking out. They could sink to the bottom of the seas to find a scroll lost to time. They could invent a whole new spell and show it off to the world, calling themselves gods for even knowing something so horribly complex. Many, many people follow this latter path. Many more aim to be recognized as a part of it. Perhaps even more via reach to the gods, to craft their own impossible spells and inscribe them on a scroll that only one person would find out of an entire century or longer. Many, but not one. The vast majority would happily team up with another, running along with their impromptu accomplice for a temporary bond in close companionship, or as allies in combat, or to backstab them in their weakest moment. The more bullheaded of the folk went on to create whole families, binding their last name to any that joined, marking them to their very core with an unspoken oath. Many, but not one. One simple man cast away the worship of godhood, a single person, happily did away with the promises of companionship or peerless power. Why? Why do away with the nuance of power? Why stray away from the promise of safety in a world that would take a bite out of you for breakfast and chew on your remains for dinner? Why cast out the possibility of achieving a power rarely reached to ensure you never find an end? Why throw your life away like this? These questions were nothing to this man. He was a loner. Yet, he was not lonely. In his journey to climb the ladder of recognition, in his journey to prove that life was not so spite-worthy to cast even the weakest aside, he made friends, he made allies, yet he made enemies. Those, those that couldn't tolerate the idea of the weak challenging a determined cast rose. Those that feared the possibility of him gaining every bit of power that might have previously been hidden from the mortal viewing rose. In the middle of his journey, the soloist life became hell. It became scorched by arcane flames that danced around the grasses of a temporary home. It became a wasteland, plant life in stasis between life or death, encased in a tomb of ice thicker than the skull of the stubborn. It became uprooted, cast aside, and flung to the heavens in spectacular displays of magical prowess and spellcasting. To most, the threat of a one-on-one -on -one was barely a threat at all. However, to clean glory from a rising star, there was never simply one. Ashes could dirty the fingers of many that came to pounce on this soul of fighter, limbs frostbitten from misfires by friends and foe alike. Even the gods scorched the earth in desperation, as many that stood up at the top did so through the power of commandeering the wild itself. Yet, he prevailed. He butted heads with family after family, a receptionist to pile after pile of war dedicated to little more than a single head. He practiced with allies, drilling the lessons of combat into his head as if they were academics, as if they were his life, as if the doubts to a life any bit lengthy weren't clouding his focused head. Fortunately, the cloud would not be forever. In his final fight, it would look as if the heavens descended and ravaged the world. Static ran throughout the displaced grounds, singeing the rare planted grasses and shocking any that dare step upon it unprotected. Trees were no longer standing proud nor tall, burned at the trunk with remnants of its life scattered in the midst, setting anything nearby ablaze. A new tundra sprouting from the ground as a result of wildly casted spells that harnessed a sunless earth, and a symphony of snapping that could be heard from miles away. Lives were lost, energy was lost, yet at last he could say that he had won. Hero was a rather young boy, determined of becoming, well, a hero. Yet, he clung on to that ideal. When he grew to the age of 16, he waved his parents goodbye as he set off on his journey. 
His fighting prowess with whatever weapon he wields made himself a name. He was enlisted to fight a war against a large group of bandits that were making preparations to raid a small village. During the war, he lost many comrades. He became one of the few survivors of the war. He quickly retired from fighting. Although he had gone almost radio silent, myths and legends were made about him. Some said he was a menace, an anti-hero. However, the most prominent myth is that he is the reincarnation of the King of Hope. I will not be reading Oatmeal's lore because he now has official lore, and I just feel it's pretty redundant since I already did the last video. Lord Grim Ruler, also known as Necro the Multiplier. The flames in Fang's dimensions raged, though far from common reality. The servants of order and peace felt change. It was a new child being born, though an important one. Free, dominant and powerful, a true ruler. Father, why am I here? The child said. To multiply, dominate, rule, and spread my influence. You are one of my children. Fang muttered under his scarf that covered his mouth, grabbing the child's skull as he charged the little one with power. He was quiet. Scrolls being forced into his mind, per deer, pondus, exemplum, two snaps. What a rare case. I will not disappoint you, my father. Grim bent forward in a bow, powered with the intent of servitude and real determination. The child was growing as flames were fed into his veins. His hands were set on the dark flames of Fang's dimension. Upon the snap of Fang's fingers, he was sent into the world, thus his journey commencing. Grimm went by many names, Thor, Necro, Jonathan, though the most known one is Grimm. This specific Chias took the Multiply part too serious throughout his journey. It seems he had built a harem of various heroes and villains, leading various children into becoming Ronin, as well as spreading dozens of his clones across the world to aid him in his battle. It is unknown who is the real, original, or first Grimm. It was clear he was very skilled with Perdir and Exemplum, select few believing he could rival the Empress of Thunder during his glory days, but quickly suppressed after he became temporarily inactive during his journey for an unknown reason. The women that he had loved are unknown or unspecified. Same goes for his potential children. He's believed to be infertile and not even tried to have them in the first place. He scored across the lands, joining many groups of warriors with the intent of spreading his father figure's influence. Familia, Amaterasu, Rez, various groups of great and most importantly powerful fighters until he founded Ruler, a small but strong house of people who serve him. Though, most temporarily, he thanks the time he spent on his selfish goals. Eventually, Grimm mysteriously lost the second snap spell for an unknown cause. He believes he is getting older and weaker. Despite Grimm's nature that roots from death and black flames, he is seen by some as a very humble and nice man, but aggressive at select few, most likely Fang's enemies. Rhea, Blade's Curse. Rhea, though she may have looked ordinary, she was not. Her parents were assassinated when she was about nine. Rhea, being who she is, wanted revenge and to spill the blood of the ones who killed her childhood caretakers and her only friends. Luckily enough, when Rhea was out training her body, she found an orant. One day, Rhea was wandering around the forest with her orant in her hand, seeking someone who would craft her a scythe, her favorite weapon of her childhood. A strange voice came from above her head, asking if Rhea needed a sight. With no thinking, Rhea gave out a nod, as a yes. A strange woman dropped down from one of the trees, greeting Rhea. My name's too. What's yours? Rhea answered every question in hope she could experience the feeling of wielding a scythe again. To explain that she would also need scythe parts, she could find a bar. The handle would cost 1,000 silver, and the blade would cost 2,000 silver. Rhea just barely had the silver needed, so she bought the parts. Now wielding a scythe, over a period of time, Rhea slowly became a monster. One refused to teach her the fighting style he mastered, known as Wraith, unless she became more malicious. Rhea, 
overwhelmed with rage, despair, and sadness, decided to turn and kill everyone she could with her scythe, training her skills. One decided to teach her the ways of the wraith after she had become an expert killer. Rhea trained for ten years, just to get revenge for the ones who loved and raised her. Ten years later, she went to find the ones that killed her parents, succeeding in a way. Being in a forest covered in bushes, trees, and with no signs of civilization, she suddenly saw two people in front of her. They were wearing black cowls, coats, and were completely covered in black, not showing their faces either. She said to herself, how did they? But before she could end the sentence, Rhea blinked and saw no one in front of her. She turned around seeing them again before blinking and being covered in pitch black void. She blinked again and found herself behind a strange man. Did he teleport or did she turn around? My name is Fang. I know what you went through and I want to help you, the mysterious figure said. Why would I trust you, Rhea asked. Then the figure turned back to her, showing only his eyes. I know you're trying to avenge your parents. I know where the ones that killed your parents are, though I want something in exchange. Rhea listened to Fang. It was her chance. Rhea thought about it, trying to remember everything she knew about Fang. Throughout the time that passed, she enjoyed getting stronger and stronger, getting more powerful throughout killing her enemies. She accepted the offer, becoming his servant. In exchange, as promised, Fang told her about the assassins and Rhea went out to seek them. While in the void, Fang granted Rhea the ability to come to him whenever she wants. Rhea traveled to a village and as promised, the two assassins were there, sitting on chairs near the entrance of the bar. Rhea knew about them because of Fang. She knew their names, faces, and everything else. Rhea looked at them, and they stared back. The two assassins got up from their chairs, knowing what's to come. One of the assassins started, rushing at Rhea, not expecting a parry. As a punishment for being weak, Rhea cut the assassin's arm off with her scythe while backing off. The other assassin was already behind her, due to his fast movement and cloak skills. Rhea, however, already knew about it, blocking his attack and giving out one herself. A brutal one. There was only one left. Without a chance to block any of Rhea's attacks, she pulled the assassin towards her and removed his head off his body. Rhea proceeded to accomplish all of Fang's requests, killing, capturing, destroying, mostly killing virtuous people, primarily vigilantes because the world was being flooded by them, due to a hero known as Winter, the Child of the Frost. Once Rhea was ordered to kill a virtuous Oculus Greatsword, the fight was so long, not even three pages of a book could describe the whole fight. Basically, Rhea got her leg injured, and she couldn't run at all. Though the greatsword she was fighting was near death, he managed to flee with Rhea failing. She returned to Fang, seeking more power. She kneeled before him, and Rhea, being a good servant of his, he granted her powers of being capable to cast Exemplum, one of Fang's spells. Being able to cast a spell to make clones of herself, Clones that could only brawl with their fists made her fairly stronger. She enjoyed killing and learned about the world, spells, different arts of different weapons and techniques and so on. Rhea started to meet Fang's other servants, mostly due to requests from Fang that required more people or just talking to them and acquiring knowledge from them. I will not be reading um, Zenith the Fool's Lore because <laughs> his lore doesn't have any periods and it's pretty unreadable for me to at least it's pretty unreadable for me to do out loud, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put myself through that. Hope you guys enjoyed, and thanks for watching.